Okay, so previously we've looked at the ideal gas law and how we can use it to quantify the relationship between pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. Right? That's what the ideal gas law gives us the ability to relate. So now what we're going to do is we're going to apply this to a chemical reaction. So kind of like we've used molar mass to convert between moles and mass, right? Mass is our measurable quantity for a solid or liquid. We want to use the ideal gas law to use moles, which we can get from a chemical equation, to some of the other various physical properties of a gas, volume, maybe temperature that it's at, or in this case, pressure. So here we're going to work through an example and see how we can apply the ideal gas law. So we have this reaction here. We have sodium hypochlorite. It's a solid, so the subscript S means it's a solid, producing sodium chloride and oxygen gas. And so what we're told is that we have 7.44 grams of our sodium hypochlorite. Uh, it's reacting in a 1.50 liter container at 300 Kelvin. Okay, so that means we know the temperature and the volume of our container. What pressure will the gas exert when the reaction is done? Okay, so first, let's identify what's going to exert a pressure. Not our sodium hypochlorite. It's a solid, not our product sodium chloride. It's a solid, just our oxygen gas. Okay, so that's what's going to exert a pressure. Our oxygen gas is going to exert a pressure when the reaction is done. So basically, what we want to find out what pressure will our oxygen exert. Well, for us to know that, we're going to use the ideal gas law, right? So we have pressure volume equals number of moles times R times T. Okay, so check. We know the volume of our container. We also know the temperature of the gas. R is a constant that we know. And so if I need to figure out the pressure of my container, that means I got to know the number of moles of whatever gas is going to exert a pressure inside this container. Well, we've identified that it's only going to be oxygen. So basically what we got to figure out is how many moles of oxygen do we have? So now this becomes reactant to product mole conversion. All right, so if we know we have 7.44 grams of our sodium hypochlorite, what we want to figure out is, well, how many moles of oxygen are we going to make? We don't care about the mass, right? We care about the moles if we want to find the, the pressure of oxygen when all of this fully reacts. Well, for us to do that, we, got to, we know that there's a mole relationship between these two, so we first got to get to the moles of our sodium hypochlorite. So one mole of sodium hypochlorite is going to have a mass of 74.44 grams, right? And that's just its molar mass. Well, now we would have the moles of sodium hypochlorite to get to the moles of oxygen, right? We're going to use our mole ratio, two moles to one. So one mole of oxygen is going to be formed for every two moles of sodium hypochlorite we react. And so we're going to find that we have 0 0.0500 moles of oxygen. Okay, so this is how much oxygen is produced from the reaction of our 7.44 grams of sodium hypochlorite. <clears throat> well now, we know the number of moles of our gas. We're now able to find the pressure of our container. So maybe if we rearrange this a little bit, we want to find pressure, we can move volume over here. And so we would find the pressure of our oxygen gas is going to be equal to nRT over V. And so now we know each one of these. We know the number of moles, we know the volume of our container, and we know the temperature it's at. So now it just becomes plugging in what we know. 0 0.05 moles are 0 0.0821 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. I'm going to ignore the units for a second because we ran out of space. Okay, and then times our temperature, 300K. And this is all going to be over the volume of our container, 1.50 liters. So we go ahead and we plug this in, and we would find that we would get 0.821 atmospheres as the pressure that our oxygen gas exerts. So again, we went back and we used the relationships that we already used before, just stoichiometry. If we're going to convert the moles of one reactant to a product, we're first going to find the moles from our mass, so we use our molar mass. And then we identify that oxygen is the only thing that's going to exert a pressure. It's the only gas in this container. 
So if we wanted to find the pressure of the container, we had to find the number of moles of oxygen because we had our volume of our container and the temperature that our gas is going to be at. Once we did that, we found the number of moles. We went ahead and plugged it in, and we found our pressure in atmospheres. Okay, so we see that the ideal gas law is another tool in our belt that we can use to relate moles of reactants to something. Right? Molar mass gives us the ability to relate moles of reactants or products to mass. Now we have the ideal gas law that gives us the ability to relate moles of a reactant or product, whatever we may be looking at, to one of these other properties, maybe a pressure of it, if we know a fixed volume and temperature, maybe the volume of the gas that's produced at a fixed pressure and some temperature, but it gives us the ability to relate the number of moles of a reactant or product to one of the physical uh, properties of a gas, pressure, volume, and temperature. So we're going to go ahead and continue working through some more of these practice problems in class. Uh, hopefully this gives us a good idea of how we can start thinking about using the ideal gas law within chemical reactions.